Great. So good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, my name is uh, David Risley. I am a faculty member re re representing the American University of Beirut. And our session, our panel session, is entitled Notes from the Digital Humanities Institute of Beirut, 2017, uh, which I have decided today to rename Postcards from DHIB 2017. Um, the idea being that what we're actually going to have in our panel discussion is a bit, some very short um, accounts of what the participants in that event that took place in Beirut in early March of this year, what were some of their experiences. Um, and the idea is, to, is, a, is, an, is an opportunity to share back to the community an event that was partially funded by the Amical Consortium. So um, I'm a faculty member, uh, a literary historian, I'm a medievalist, uh, grounded really in sort of uh, serious, old-fashioned research uh, in the humanities. And there's this thing called, or this thing called these things, maybe we should talk about it in the plural, called the digital humanities that have emerged in, let's say, the last 15 years. And I've been involved with those for some years now, and one of our ideas, I also happen to be the chair of the Digital Scholarship Committee at Amical. The ideas we had was to actually have an event to bring together um, Amical members interested in such a topic uh, to the events that we we're having in Beirut. So um, with a uh, grant um, from uh, Amical, we brought 15 members um, of the Amical that event. So the people in front of you on the stage are, that are talking today are not actually the only people in the room who attended that event. Um, first of all, the organizers of the event, so there was myself, there was Naja Jarkas, there was Rayan Fayad, there was Fatima, all people who participate in Amical. So if you can raise your hands, perhaps those who are here, Fatima. And then we also had uncountable, no, not uncountable, but 15 members of the uh, consortium from very, very different schools. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just see a hand if you had, uh, if you were in the room of those who actually attended the event. So, ja, right, Jean Lai, great, and Jasmina, right, and Nadine, and Sandrella, right, awesome. So they were coming from Lebanon, but also brought from the various uh, Amical institutions. So this event was sponsored by another uh, Andrew Mellon uh, Foundation um, that created the Center for the Arts and Humanities. So it's a kind of a, a coming together of two Mellon uh, initiatives. And it was a pretty exciting event. So let me tell you, uh, just uh, let me express just for a minute. So those of you in the room who are probably asking yourself, what are the digital humanities, right? Um, I think like a lot of the words that we've heard in this very conference, uh, information literacy, uh, an older word, interdisciplinarity, right? Fake news, etc. There are these these portmanteau words, or these words that that uh, that mean that end up meaning a lot of different things in a lot of different environments. What I can say, though, in a very very simple way, is that the digital humanities are a very very intense form of collaboration between faculty, technologists, and librarians for knowledge production. And so picking up on the keynote that we just heard, this idea uh, that, 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 that uh, technologists emerging into research roles, the digital humanities, I think, plays a really important role um, for that. Also for librarians and also for other kinds of non-faculty members, including students, right, in institutions. So for me, the particular thing which is interesting, and this is an argument that I made at a, at a lecture that I gave at the American University of Paris a couple, several weeks ago now, is that digital humanities in the kinds of institutions that we have, amical institutions, liberal arts institutions, are really well adapted to course embedded, active learning, undergraduate research focused teaching. And so that's what I'm, that, that's all I'm going to say today. We've got five people uh, who were attending the event. We're going to begin um, with Kim Fox from the American University of Cairo, then Farooq Shahzad from Foreman Christian College in Pakistan, then uh, Kathleen Will Smith from Ryder Kuba from American University of Cairo, and finally uh, my co organizer for the event, Najla Jarka. They're going to have about five minutes 
to just share some exp some some something to the community about what actually happened there, and we're going to keep them to those five minutes so that we have plenty of time for discussion in this session. Panel for the entire community. So with that, Kim. I'm ready with the timer. Great. I was at the DHIB as a facilitator for a podcasting workshop. I think it's becoming pretty obvious that I love audio and everything about it. And so the session I was facilitating was a 10 hour session. So it was five hours over a two day period. The attendance was relatively small on the second day, but on the first day it was a combination of librarians, technologists, students, uh, community members, and, and that diversity really helped to forward our discussions as we talked about podcasting, not just from a interviewing, talking to one another perspective, but from a narrative storytelling perspective. Uh, what kind of story are you trying to tell? What kind of stories could you share? Uh, who might the audience be? From a teaching perspective, when you're using audio in the classroom, we also address the topic of how to assess the creative work that students are producing. So the conversations were very rich and that was uh, quite interesting. We also ventured into the topic of oral histories and archiving because there seems to be one of the participants was interested in an initiative to do in, in Beirut that involves some oral histories and, and archiving. And we talked about methodologies and best practices for that potential project. Also, the sharing of resources, as we were trying to work on producing a podcast. I'm all about the, not just attend a conference, but let's make something while we're here. And in this regard, we were trying to figure out the best ways to share. In this instance, we decided on Google the Google platform. So we use Google Docs to share audio files, to share scripts, uh, and things like that. And it did work relatively uh, easy enough for all of us. Uh, there was also a use of some of the Apple devices where you can use the AirDrop to share content relatively fast. Moving on to a few other things that were some of the takeaways. Uh, the, the ability to be flexible. Uh, I did have a bit of a syllabus and a bit of a plan that was not quite executed as I scripted it to be. And so there was a little bit of adjustment uh, in that the participants weren't able to get the content to produce the podcast that I had envisioned we'd come out of the, the workshop with. And the podcast were relative, the idea was the podcast would be relatively short, about five minutes, and in the interview style, which can be relatively easy to do, meaning that I could take my phone right now and come and interview you and produce a podcast, as I did yesterday. So it can be done. But it, for me, as a professor, it was one of those moments that says, yeah, the different learning styles, that, that you can't just have this template to teach everyone the same thing the same way all the time. But moving on to the takeaways and after Beirut and what we're doing. It's uh, definitely a spin-off of some of the other things I've been talking about with Hoda and I had the Birds of a Feather session yesterday on the Audio Diaries project that we're working on. And we do have a small grant from Amical for this project. So we really are pushing it as we take a, a moment to do the recap from the past semester where Hoda did the pilot. And this Audio Di Diaries project is something that we want to create a template for so that other Amical universities can incorporate it into their curriculums. We want this project to be something that is interdisciplinary. It's not something specifically for, say in my case, journalism and mass comm. It's something that should be available for uh, you to incorporate in your classes and to share in your different kinds of workshops. We are also trying to take this project and say, we don't just want to do interview style podcasts. We want the digital humanities component to be a part of that. What is the story that you're trying to tell? How do we get students to tell their stories and to give us more than just what happened in the classroom? And, and, and these opportunities will be challenging, but we're definitely interested in this, this challenge that's ahead of us. Uh, the project for the audio diaries should run us about uh, at least three years, if, if not longer, as we try to get some of the students to 
uh, do some reflection, to produce one audio diary, maybe produce another. Uh, sort of uh, what Kristen said with the journaling, to try to get some reflective moments from students in that capacity. So that's pretty much where we are in, in that regard for moving forward and some of the takeaways. Yeah, thank you. That was five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I work in radio. I can meet a deadline. Yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> so I, along with my two other colleagues from Foreman Christian College, participated in DHIB. Uh, Ms. Mehreen Tahir and Ms. Ch Mr. Shakir uh, Gill was also along with me. And um, so I would also speak on their behalf as well. So before giving my feedback, I would just let you know about my background so that you know how my knowledge was about digital humanities and how now it is. Uh, I'm working as reference and research librarian at APC College and my duties are more linked with the reference work and information literacy. So my knowledge, uh, I was about a layman in terms of digital humanities. Uh, so when I came here, uh, came to Beirut to attend the Digital Humanities Institute, you know, it just helped me a lot and uh, we learned a lot. And uh, uh, before that, I used to think that it is something about digitization. Uh, only. But after attending the uh, DHIB, uh, the, the concept cleared and uh, I knew that it's much more beyond digitization. Digitization is just a start, it's just a foundation store where you can build a whole building. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, things like mapping, audio video podcasting, sound productions, uh, 3D SketchUp, so things like that. I came to New York uh, for the first time. And uh, uh, the long workshop which I attended, uh, it was the Drupal, uh, the content management system, and we learned a lot uh, in detail about the Drupal, uh, how we can use taxonomies, categories, and uh, we can, how we can create web interfaces. We also learned how to uh, install different plugins. So we are using uh, the, um, our website at FC College is uh, WordPress, which is also a content manage management system, so that was quite helpful in that regard also. And uh, the keynotes, uh, they were also quite knowledgeable. And you know, uh, to, uh, through David's uh, keynote, we came to know about uh, uh, the projects that are going on in the Arab world in digitization and digital humanities. And uh, also, the keynote of the Hassan Murad uh, was very, uh, very, very relevant to us because he discussed various issues that are uh, that are being faced in terms of OCR in Arabic. Um, I would let you know that. Urdu, which is our national language, is similar to Arabic. Uh, so uh, uh, when you join Urdu and Arabic words, key uh, characters, they take a different shape. So it creates a lot of problem in terms of OCR. So it was also relevant for us. And uh, beside these keynotes and the main workshops, even um, uh, the lightning talks and um, the, the informal discussions were quite fruitful, thought provoking, and you know it gave a lot of ideas. For example, you know, watching the Virtual mu Museum of Digital Humanities Institute at University of Balamon, uh, I thought, you know, we have uh, some pictures, we have around four or five hundred pictures of uh, our alumni at taken at different events. Uh, so uh, what we can do is that we can scan, we can retouch them, and we can refine them, and we can create a similar uh, virtual museum or what we can uh, uh, what else we can do is that we can uh, create a network of uh, alumni by you know uh, and show them on uh, through uh, and we can use mapping technology to show them on different uh, geographical areas so these were the things that um, uh, I learned and uh, it was quite fruitful and uh, uh, in the last I would also like to thank uh, uh, the Amical and the DHIB organizers uh, that gave us the opportunity to attend uh, the, the, the DH, uh, uh, DHIB Institute um, uh, because you know uh, we are also looking forward to establish a digital humanities hub so we have also discussed uh, uh, this with uh, David so um, that uh, that uh, DHIB was also quite helpful in in that regard, and uh, you know the discussions with the David are also quite helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Kathleen Hewitt Smith. Um, um, 
is this okay? Yeah. Um, I came to the Digital Humanities Institute as a department head, a Department of English Language and Literature at the American University of Sharjah, as David indicated. Primarily because um, I myself am a humanist. I do uh, South Asian literature. All, but as a department head, I don't have a lot of room for creating these wonderful new digital humanities projects myself. But uh, we're doing a lot of hiring in my department, and I know my uh, new faculty are very interested in these fields. So I wanted to be able to think um, of ways to be able to support them. To do that, I needed to better understand the kinds of projects they might be interested in doing, the kinds of projects that I know also our librarians and technology people are interested in collaborating on us with. So for me, it was meant to be educative so that I could support others uh, primarily. Um, my own um, workshop that I attended in order to stretch my own mind was the Python coding workshop. And we've talked a lot about pressing the boundaries of knowledge and pressing the boundaries of administrative tolerance and all these things. I tell you, that pressed the boundaries of my brain. <laughs> because for me, um, learning coding language, actually coding things, was uh, ed ed not only educative, but literally kind of mind-blowing and gave me an understanding of what it means to collaborate among very different kinds of disciplines, different kinds of approaches, different kinds of literal ways of thinking. So I found that um, very um, de positively destabilizing for me as an academic thinker, and I hope I can translate back that back to my own faculty when I talk with them about the projects they're interested in. Some of the observations I have about the Institute are more um, structural and come from a kind of, again, a kind of administrative department head perspective, and so I'll just share those, some of those with you. Um, one of the things I found most um, illuminating about gaining a better understanding of digital humanities is that the digital humanities not only facilitates knowledge in the way we've been talking um, for most of this conference as well, the way that IT and library and faculty can work together to support one another and expand knowledge, but digital humanities also creates um, bodies of knowledge that can be used by others. And this, to me, um, was a, a definition which was more expansive and which might allow even more forms of collaboration in thinking about the possibilities for DH. Um, it's genuinely and necessarily collaborative and interdisciplinary, but, also, but at the individual level, at the departmental level, at the interdepartmental level, and even at interdivisional levels. Um, and can bridge divides which I think are strong and deep between academic departments and other learning centered divisions on campus, exactly like what we've been talking about in these um, sessions on this uh, conference. Um, because digital humanities no is not embedded in a field, a particular field, or a particular department, um, or even a particular region of the world, or a particular kind of institution, it can easily function within and contribute to multicultural environments, particularly when working with students and using it for student projects. So it's a way to be able to access and work with very diverse groups It'll, it's in, a, in a way that might be even more productive than other approaches that we use. Um, our speaker on the first day and others since have talked about the appeal of the kinds of IT uh, technologies um, that we've been talking about these last few days um, to youth culture and certainly digital humanities falls into that. Our students grow up with these things, they grow up with visual and, visual and technological um, aptitudes that many of us um, didn't have and maybe don't have to the level that they do. So it's very useful um, for working with today's students. And also, um, the very another illuminating thing for me was that much we talked about budgets. Uh, much of the software can be crowdsourced, um, and some of the work can be undertaken in ways that are budget friendly or even free. Um, and can c and you can collaborate with with not only other academics but with people who aren't in academia in a very powerful way, in a very modern way. I think so. These were the sort of <laughs> opportunities that I took back um, about digital humanities. I also felt um, that there were some uh, serious challenges um, in this area. Um, and um, I put these in a sort of form of questions. And one of the thing I kept, things I kept thinking about was, is an institution organized 
Are, are our institutions organized in such a way to facilitate or even allow collaborations of the sorts we've been talking about? Um, how is the work of those people doing digital humanities across divisions evaluated in a real life, I, I, I'm, I didn't, I'm breaking, evaluated in a real life end of year report, for example, or for evaluation for raises and things. So how are people evaluated who are doing this work? Um, DH requires IT support and IT, and IT is expensive. Um, uh, without a home in a silo department, division, et cetera, how can DH be funded? For what would the funding source be? And finally, many of us are at American style institutions, all of us, and we spend a lot of time, nonetheless, exploring, defending, developing, and understanding of the liberal arts. Um, we also face uh, the same challenges developing understanding of humanities. That's even more challenging sometimes. Talking about an understanding of digital humanities, it's even more challenging. Um, these are the sorts of things I think we encounter when we take these wonderfully productive ideas and try and bring them back and put them into the day-to-day -day functioning of a real department um, and, and a real institution. Thank you, and sorry for going over. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hi, I'm the Digital Collections Archivist at the American University in Cairo. Um, and I also attended the Python workshop as well as Voyant, which is a text analysis tool, um, which I spent 10 hours attempting to learn Python. Um, and I did not, was not so successful. But it was very useful um, for me, and I think for all of us, really, to understand and a challenge how much we need to learn. Do I need to code an entire program to scrape metadata from a website myself? Can I use what Stanford has created? Or do I need to learn enough to be able to edit what Stanford has done, especially working with Arabic texts? So I think the workshop and the institute was very useful in just exposing myself and others to the tools available that we can um, either use out of the box or tweak to our own needs, or if I'm doing something really crazy, write a whole program if necessary, but inshallah that will not happen. Um, so that's one of the, uh, the challenges and something very beneficial to the workshop. Um, it also took up a lot of my time. I'll say for Voyant, it was a very useful text analysis tool. I know other people in the room were there. Um, and I'm looking forward to using it with thesis titles to kind of track how AEC students have changed or not changed with the times. Um, I'm sure we can all imagine after 2011, certain topics were more popular than others. And the 50s is all about uh, industrial um, machines and whatnot. Um, another project that was interesting, a poster a student did, I believe, David at AUB, was about uh, printing presses in Beirut. And we've talked about that in Cairo with the Baluk Press, which is the, or was the government agency. Um, something I'll mention probably a couple other times, is the Arabic Collections Online project, which AUC is a part of, and AUB, and maybe some other institutions here, but at least those two, which we're providing 3,000 volumes of Arabic text to be digitized and hosted by NYU. Um, so this will be a huge corpus, and I assume, I'm not an expert in uh, medieval, mid Middle Eastern studies, I assume it's kind of an open field, and this data will be very useful for researchers and um, finding um, new studies and new information. Um, the other thing for Amico is the digital collections um, chairman for the for the group. Um, I, David asked where we thought maybe Amico should go. Um, I'm a very non-theoretical person and I like messing up. So I imagine maybe a future workshop where we bring a bunch of data because I have a lot of half-started projects and a lot of data. And you know we bring it and come together, and people who know a lot more about subjects, like Catherine or David, who are academics, can be like, can help it have more insight on what value the data has, um, and maybe what useful information or useful stories can be told. Because to me, that's what separates digital humanities from digitization. Digitization is a bunch of data, and digital humanities is using using tools to pull out information from the data that tells the story. Um, and so I think that, to me, would be something would be for Amical. I know um, I've talked about this with some, some people for digital collections. We do a bunch of web archiving at AUC. So we have a ton of websites from um, particularly the uh, Arab Spring, but they aren't really being used. And it would be interesting if somebody who knew a lot more about the politics and the language and whatnot could extract that data and see how different websites are linked 
um, to see maybe the language used and how that changes over time. Um, but again, that's something is in my role in the digital collections committee, I view more of us su providing support for the data and then the digital scholarship committee may be doing more of the analysis and the um, academic type work. I don't know how David and the rest of Jeff, I guess, feels, but that's kind of how I um, envision it. Um, I think I have... Uh, so the last thing, which is exciting, um, AUC is hiring a digital humanities librarian, um, hopefully, and so I'm not um, exactly sure what my role will be going forward. My, all my bosses are here right now, so they can maybe <laughs> shed light on that. <laughs> maybe I have no role, and this is my last damn call. Um, <laughs> but so it'll be very exciting, and I think it'll be good for AUC and good for Amico, and hopefully we can, both the um, Digital Collection Committee and myself and the future Digital Humanities Librarian can support other institutions and really um, work with you all to help grow the digital humanities in Amico. All right, I think that's that. Group. Okay, thank you, Ryder. You just prepared for what I was, what I'm going to try to do now. Um, I have this bad habit of starting with a hypothesis, uh, deconstructing it, and then trying to put it back together. And what Ryder said was really, really um, important. So um, I'm talking as um, someone who teaches uh, literature courses as well as writing the discipline courses at the American University of Beirut, and who decided to take the risk of um, integrating some digital humanities um, uh, projects in my courses. Um, I attended uh, two courses that David uh, gave, and then I started doing my own uh, digital projects, and actually working as uh, one of the co-organizers for this uh, event was um, an eye-opener, because it's very easy to put a theory and believe in it, but when you come to the actual work, you see things are not as perfect as they look. So the, according to the literature, it's very important to establish a balance between the various activities undertaken in the digital humanities, such as teaching and learning, research, uh, resource creation, and technical support, in order for homegrown digital humanities activities to continue to emerge, grow, and be sustained rather than falter away. Um, as I said, this is much easier said than actually applied. Um, I have some knowledge about what happened be before the Digital um, Humanities Institute in 2017, because we had a number of previous iterations and fora. Um, we have a very good um, shared services and infrastructure at AUB, which help uh, facilitate the event. We have collaborative activities, such as um, the Digital Humanities uh, Faculty Learning Community at AUB, uh, which is made up of people from the English department, uh, instructors um, working in the communication skills program, and someone who used to work in the agriculture department, including an, um, a librarian from LAU. And we started a sound project. Um, we didn't really continue it, but we're going to go back to that um, as soon as we can. We also have some transdisciplinary research collaborations, like people are co-authoring books, papers, um, doing workshops, hands-on training sessions, and so on. And we have what David uh, once uh, gave me um, as a really useful phrase, we have some small DH colonies. So, we, um, so when we were um, organizing, it was very uh, easy to actually locate the experts the emerging scholars, faculty, undergraduates, uh, postgraduates, technologists at AUB, and make them, you know, help us uh, with the event, either um, logistically speaking or, you know, actually to present. Um, our organizing committee, as David said, is uh, made up of a university librarian, um, someone from IT, faculty from the English department, and a student. Now, during the event, um, what I realized was that the workshops given by some of the Amical presenters, they actually reveal the amount of time that you need to build a community of practice. It's not easy on the institutional level and beyond to actually 
build what is really known as a community of practice. The lightning talks that were given um, at the end, they showed moments of internal exploration or self-assessment of what have we been doing, what are we going to do next, and there was a lot of enthusiasm to push forward on uh, future plans. Uh, networking with amical and non-amical members during the event was very, very important because after uh, the event, um, I was able to um, identify possible partnerships and so on. Um, on the 10th uh, of April, um, there was a Digital Humanities uh, event taking place in Abu Dhabi, um, uh, I think uh, organized by David. So I managed to Skype with someone from IT because I couldn't get a visa to get, to get there. And for three hours and a half, we did um, a really interesting workshop. To me, it was very useful because although there were only five or six people, but I managed to do, you know, to get over the panic of using Skype for three hours and a half. And uh, Rana from IT was there. We, were, we did a workshop on Timeline JS, Palladio, Voyant tools, and the writing or literature classroom. And the feedback we got was really useful and we have, okay. Um, on a personal level, um, there's a, pa a possible partnership with Anne Gardner, who was one of the uh, participants. Um, on a digital uh, project on literary salons in Europe, and I'm going to carry it to investigate what's happening in Damascus, Beirut, Aleppo, and Cairo. There's a partnership with Fatima from the uh, libraries on digital and info literacy co-design of two courses, uh, including a new one that I'll be giving in the fall. Um, there's also a forthcoming AUB conference on women and technology, which I hope to be able to present a paper on how to facilitate an infrastructure that will allow for these things, um, digital humanities projects to stay. Uh, also, there's a possible um, collaboration with Angie on um, uh, a digital project that her students and mine will be working on. Her course is in, uh, uh, entitled Concepts of Modern Art. Mine is Introduction to Digital Humanities, where there's a major module on modern art and modernism. Um, also, um, uh, I applied to go and attend a training session on stylometry in Leipzig um, uh, this summer, and um, therefore I'll be also um, uh, support, like creating or organizing a workshop at AUB in the, in the spring on stylometry and invite some of the trainers. Uh, there's a partnership with Jean-Christophe, of the, the director of the Digital Humanities Department of IFPO, and we have plans to uh, create something called the Digital Humanities Cafe. We'll start our first um, informal meeting early spring, uh, sorry, uh, end of September or early October. And there are two, work, I'm working on two documents. Um, one is recommendations for good practices to support the EDGE projects in the classroom. How do we enhance students' critical engagement in digital assignments in a way that could be transferred to other courses or um, in, the workshop, in the workplace, sorry. The second one, which is gonna bring me back to the first statement I started um, at this, um, when I was presenting, how do we break the barriers set up by institutions to allow for real collaboration and proper application of what is referred to as a community of practice, starting with AUB and looking at, um, you know what, other institutions have as models. Thank you. So I, th I, think, uh, I think you heard a, I mean, a real wide uh, spectrum of opinions and, um, and, and, and takeaway from that particular event. The one thing I would like to underscore is that I think uh, what we did, one of the things that I like the most about um, the digital humanities that resonates a lot with the discussions that we have here in Amical is learning um, that goes on in such a um, The professors, if you want to call them, at this workshop, right, which uh, Kim called herself a facilitator, right? Um, there were other people who were workshop leaders, you know, whatever, whatever the term is for the person who's leading this workshop, they went from literature professor down to undergraduate, 
right? And so actually one of my students was running several of these workshops, right? And so I think that that capacity and that of, 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 of building capacity not only uh, across institutions, but all And something that we have to um, just try. So um, I thought that what we would do here is we're at uh, 11 o'clock, so we have some time uh, in which to take questions from the audience. Wonder what it looked like. So I think we'll just open it up to the group now. We have a question. Just one second. We'll get you the we'll get you the the microphone. Yes. So, hi. Um, as you know, I obviously uh, attended. I attended the event, and um, and my mind is not so much a question as much as uh, a kind of cry for help. Not really a cry for help, but I mean. Um, during the event, I was lucky enough to take um, the workshop on, um, you know, games and how you can, you know, create a narrative to create a game on Twine. And it really got me thinking, I actually really want to create a game um, that's kind of like Sherlock Holmes style, where students are reading uh, articles and news items and going through that so that they can figure out which ones you know are good and credible and which are not with like you know a narrative framework work kind of like a murder mystery to kind of get them involved and they have to find the right clues let's say to get to who did it or so to sp so to speak so if anyone's interested in collaborating with me uh, please <laughs> you know, come see me during <laughs> lunch, please. Um, and I'd just like to add that, um, you know, with regards, you know, to the reflections and uh, the, the event itself, um, I think it's very important, you know, um, for us all to, you know, not only, you know, um, I think really think about you know, the digital humanities and the potential in the digital humanities. But as David was saying, you know, the kind of role shifts and, you know, the role that students can play in that learning process for us as faculty members and librarians, uh, etc. Thank you. I I think I heard you, Najla, saying that you have an librarian from LAU who's helping you. Yeah, isn't La Giselle a librarian? No, Giselle is not a librarian. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay, I got it wrong. Uh, no problem. That's it. So what is she? <laughs> she's an uh, English instructor. Ah, uh, okay. But she's the person in charge of our LMS in uh, at okay. LAU. Okay, thank you for correcting mm -hmm. me. It's interesting, though, how the roles become yeah. <laughs> clear, and then we think that someone is something that they're actually not. Uh, this is just a comment, and I would like really to thank David and uh, to thank Najla that gave the library the chance uh, to really enter a field that we are scared of entering, regardless of the opinion of everybody, that you are not able to enter this uh, field. But really, it, uh, it is. Uh, uh, it complements our work and it makes uh, uh, us really uh, recognize that we need each other, we need cooperation uh, because the digital humanities projects are uh, very important and very impressive in teaching and in visualizing information. But also the library can be helpful in preserving and in uh, providing discovery for these uh, projects. And we did actually two people from the library did participate in training in because we are uh, developing content management system and uh, uh, online exhibition tools and the OCR Arabic OCRing and digitization. Thank you. Also, anyone else who was at the event who would like to share something is also. Okay. Um, 
I didn't join the panel, but in an effort to help document and report on DHIB, uh, Mahabeli and I gave um, a five-hour workshop on um, regional di digital pedagogy where we talked with our participants about um, how they can contextualize their digital pedagogy to make it relevant to their own context and relevant to their own region because a lot of these efforts of digital pedagogy that we know about comes from the UK or the US and a lot of the times when we come to incorporate them in our own environments, not a lot of work or not a lot of effort is put into contextualizing and making them relevant and inclusive to our students. So we felt like we can make uh, or do it, conduct a critical workshop that sort of um, asks the right questions about how you can be um, uh, inclusive and how you can be critical when you're incorporating digital pedagogy. Um, that, that was the first half of the workshop and then we had a delicious lunch, Lebanese food, kind of like the beautiful food that we have here. <laughs> um, and then the, the second half of the workshop we did a critical tool parade. So the, the first half was very digital identity, very uh, inclusivity, the difference between digital skills and digital literacies, and we had some really, really interesting discussions, and Wodek and Jasmina and Kathleen were there, and we had really, really interesting discussions. And then the second half was a critical tool parade, so we were um, exposing the attendees to different tools to conduct different digital pedagogies, but also with a, with a, like a, a layer or, or another sort of angle of being critical and trying to contextualize these tools to their own environments. So asking questions like, does this tool work with, good, uh, w with internet that sort of is unstable and different countries' infrastructures, things like certain um, students not being very comfortable sharing things online publicly because of the political situation in their countries. So this is the kind of, these are the kinds of questions that we were probing and asking people to question when they are incorporating digital pedagogy in their contexts. And it was, um, I think, came up with very interesting conversations. Thanks. Thank you. I wanted to thank uh, to thank David uh, and the people who helped him organize the Digital Humanities Institute in Beirut, and also uh, Amical Small Grants because I was able to um, uh, some of uh, three colleagues of, from AUCA went to the uh, to the institute and um, and when they came back, uh, they, they had a different. Uh, ways of expressing their emotions. One was very, yeah, we need to do something. The others were like, I need to process this. And as a result of this, uh, I couldn't catch up with one of them, but with two others, we're actually having a project, uh, two projects actually coming up uh, in digital humanities. And I find this amazing uh, because this was a great spark. I don't know if sparkle is the right word, <laughs> but let's say for now it's a sparkle. So hopefully it's going to grow in a real, in a really good project. And I feel that it kind of empowers also so certain cultures, um, because um, thinking through how, like, I, it feels like these people found out how they can expand what they were doing in their classrooms to something that, uh, in in both cases actually, with both projects. Uh, something that goes beyond the, even the university. It goes. It's something that is beneficial for the country. So I, I feel that this was really empowering, and I want to thank you for that. And I hope that we'll be, we'll uh, have the chance to visit more <laughs> digital humanity in the institutes. Thank you very much. If I could just, while we're getting the next question up, I think that one of the most powerful things that comes out of this, particularly this kind of DH, which is embedded in courses and which can then spread out toward libraries and include technologists and kinds of institutions in which we are working and teaching and researching is that it it really draws upon the local right and so that the the what Angie just said right about that something which is local can become can really pass so quickly right um, through a, and the acquisition of certain critical skills in a digital age right um, Thank you.
Hello? Hello? Yeah. So I have a question. Um, Kathleen, in particular, you brought up the, the challenge you mentioned as a serious challenge. Um, the question of whether institutions are organized in ways that allow this type of collaboration. And uh, I think that's probably a, a common challenge across our institutions. Um, if you were going to pick out one or two of the particular uh, roadblocks to that kind of collaboration, you're at a stage, I think, where you're, you're trying to encourage that the, the, those conversations, that collaboration is not well uh, established yet across mm -hmm. your institution. Yeah, that's correct. Um, if you were going to pick out one or two things that you felt like could be acted upon or, or you, that you are acting upon at your, your institution, um, what's your suggestion for, what, what do you see as the, the possible points where you can act on that mm -hmm. and break down some of the barriers to yeah, the well it's a, it's a fraught question, and I'm not sure I have the answers to that. And I've been thinking about this since the DHIB. So I'll give two quick answers. One has to do with from within a department. So this would be specific to faculty um, who would like to participate in any of these kinds of things. And one of the obstacles, for example, is in hiring. So we're still a department. We have a department name. The positions have um, uh, faculty lines have sort of titles and areas, and people don't understand the outside of the department and inside the department often don't understand what it means to say this faculty member does this area, say Victorian literature, uh, but they also, we want someone who does a dig digital humanities as at least a secondary specialty. Um, I had to have a, you know, several meetings with our dean about even inserting that in the ad. We started trying to say we want to dial higher digital humanities faculty. They said ap just sim there was simply a no. There was no room for conversation. So I think you have to start at a smaller step. Let's have someone who does that as a secondary specialty. But really, it's this question of um, having a conversation about uh, the issue David started with. What is this? What is this topic? Um, um, and as I said, that's also embedded in the conversation about these days about what is humanities, what is it for? So continuing to have these conversations, not only though at the departmental level, but genuinely with external people who have control over departments. So it's deans, um, uh, provosts, uh, hiring committees, that kind of thing. So that's one of the, the points of, of, of stumbling. Um, and then the second one I mentioned was the evaluation process. So once someone's in the system and they want to start doing this, um, institutions are so tied to their, for example, and the talk that um, you gave, their learning outcomes that are so specific to courses and they have to be this way and ministries of education require this and that and the other thing. Uh, and then faculty or faculty performance is evaluated based on a lot of these things. Um, if there's no definition or no space for an understanding of what that kind of role is, then the faculty can't be evaluated, they can't be rewarded, and they might go somewhere else. Um, again, it's a simply a question of education. So I've been using the, uh, this, uh, the opportunities to speak with department heads. We'll be organizing in the fall a departmental a seminar in our own department that's meant for all of arts and sciences to talk about what is digital humanities, um, you know, how can this person be placed in the institution. We also will talk more, um, we haven't done it yet, but we hope to talk more with um, librarians, certainly, who are involved in our writing courses, uh, as you heard about last, uh, yesterday, or what's that, this morning. Um, so I think conversation is, is the key. Um, nevertheless, um, there are, at many, I don't know about other institutions, but at ours right now, um, there are so many external pressures to um, think about the institution in ways that have to do with things like efficiency and um, demonstration of achievement of certain things that are defined externally, often by education ministries or large institutional five-year plans, that these conversations have a long way to go toward having any connection to or impact on those m more rigid external, externally imposed structures. I don't know what the answer to that is, but maybe this is something we could talk about in AMICAL or at other DH um, institutes. So I don't think I really answered your question about how, but I think understanding is still very fundamental. Does anybody have any more comments or questions? Uh, 
Is there anybody still in the room thinking, what are these things? What are these digital humanities? You've heard this word like over and over and over. Can I just see a show of hands of people who are actually wondering what it looks like? Oh, everybody knows what it is then. Okay. <laughs> So there's so many different things. So let me tell you just very briefly about something that I did that actually became a project in, uh, uh, it became a project that was funded by Amical in part. So in, in a classroom setting, I was teaching in an English department, I'm teaching an English department, environment generally, teaching different subjects. This one was a history of English. And for me, teaching history of English language only as a historical narrative about the development of historical linguistic facts um, in Beirut seemed a little bit, I mean, just a little flat. Uh, and in fact, that course had the reputation of being one that was really boring <laughs> to a lot of students. So one of the ways what I did, what I, in repurposing that class or remaking that class, thinking through a digital humanities lens, one of the things that I did was to imagine students engaging with corpora, right? There's a lot of historical corpora of the English language that's out there. And so having a tool by which they could search through a corpus or look for a pattern in words or identify certain, let's call them linguistic features across time, even if it was just something as easy as the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary data section, where they can look by time and origin and by the quotations, was an incredibly powerful exercise in taking us away from the master narrative of language and looking at and, and, and putting students into an, into an encounter with the kind of the messiness of research data. And that already was an eye opener for them. But then what I wanted to do in that class is I wanted to actually embed something more. I wanted to actually embed a making project. Um, so learning through doing something. And I wanted to have a making project which was rooted locally. So how would you connect Beirut right, with a historical development of the English language? Well, Beirut is a multilingual city. A lot of people speak English, like a lot of other, well, in fact, like all the institutions that we come from right, in the American model. We exist in something of a, of a bubble of, of Anglophone society, if not larger than a bubble. Um, so what I did is I actually organized a, a method. And it actually took several semesters to kind of to refine the method, but I had students collecting samples of written language around the city using geolocating smartphones, and then using a data form tagging those samples by context, by languages found, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what we ended up with was a set of images that could be easily mapped um, in interactive digital maps, uh, web mapping environments. And the, in which students could look for patterns in multilingual usage across the city. And so we weren't actually prepared for what we were going to get. Um, it, the project is called Linguistic Landscapes of Beirut. LLBeirut.org. And it's a, a, it's a fascinating project that was sourced by students, not in the sense that they were just collecting data, but they were in the process of of, of coming to grips with what actually data is. Little tiny captured uh, samples. They were able to then think about not only what the problems of doing that are methodologically, but then the kinds of narratives, the kinds of stories, the kinds of sense that they can make out of such a mass of data. And it was really quite interesting. We ended up with 2,500 samples or so. And then we turned around and actually applied for a small grant in Amical to push that project further. Because once it left the classroom environment, what we realized is what we needed was not just a bunch of pictures that we could put on the map, but what we actually needed were a lot of transcriptions of those particular materials. What we're in the process of doing with my student, Mari Hawat, in Germany is dealing with taking the images and then transferring them, remeeting them into transcribed uh, samples, and we're going to put these. We've begun to put these in GitHub, and the idea is we will have a 2,000 plus sample of multilingual polyglossia in Beirut. And then who knows what somebody's going to do with that? 
right? But the, but the whole, so there was a kind of a classroom incubation of a project over several semesters, which then led to a uh, action between myself, an undergraduate, and our data, one of our data services people in the, inside the library. So a true kind of Amical-like uh, encounter that is now producing data. It's producing local knowledge about, you know, on a topic that people are really quite fascinated in, which is the multilingual. And so we'll have a small sample of that from Beirut for research. That's an example, I think, of how one might begin to work on this, what Angie was calling, you know, the, the, the stuff that we're doing in our class that gains legs, right, that sort of moves out into the world and then all of a sudden opens up a space for the world to look at what we're doing. just wanted to ask, does AUB or of course AUC and other institutions run a digital humanities project which is or would be library hosted based and of course include collaboration with faculty students potentially? If yes, how the initiative developed? If not, is there a specific struggle or reason for not thinking of these sort of projects? Digital collections, yeah. Yeah. So I think it, I think it probably would be hosted by the library, or I would be part of that, and we have a lot of uh, web space for that. Um, I think the biggest problem is a I'm, I have a lot of work to do, and so I can't just um, I can provide the data. That is a real part of my job is digitizing things, but I don't necessarily have the time to either um, analyze the data or um, get faculty to do so. That sort of project, but again, uh, just something faculty that would be uh, uh, library hosted in the sense that you still get the kind of projects which are similar to what you mostly covered now, mm -hmm. but they're as I can see, this would be rather faculty initiatives mm -hmm. uh, in sense of, uh, of course, I'm not saying that library would be out of it, just uh, in that line. Mm -hmm. So let's say you create something that then gets uh, library hosted or uh, not digitalization right. projects, but again, some sort of curated exhibitions, right, right, uh, right. some sort of data uh, but I think the question of what, what will become of the data which is created in the classroom, which is sort of, right, that it's a great question. I mean, we're th we had a discussion earlier today about the masses of data, or yesterday, the masses of data that individuals are creating by simply walking through school, locating device uh, in their pocket, right? I mean, we are all sort of creating data. So if we think about that inside of an, a, a micro level, right, inside of our classrooms, let's say we're creating things, what would we do with it? I think that's a great conversation to have and we came up with a solution and our solution was to push it out into the public domain and to push it into a, into a place called GitHub, right, for the, the sharing not just of code but also of data. That doesn't have to be the only solution. It's, it's a more digital dorky kind of others. But you're right, repositories. I mean, I think what, one of the things we're thinking about with that Linguistic Landscapes of Beirut project is how do we preserve the various stages of the data as we normalize it and clean it up in versions inside of our own institutional repository, right? As a record, right, of this whole, of, of, of all that actually happened. So yeah, there's a, there's, you, you, the librarians in the room, you have so many things to offer us, right, in such a project. And, but I think that, that there are a lot of conversations that we need to have about how we would work out those. The workflows be, you know, what, how can you bring your expertise to help? And I think the one thing that I would add to Ryder's comment about not having time, and also to Kathleen's comment about hiring the digital humanities faculty member and not knowing where to put them, is that if institutions are going to embark on, in, in such directions, librarians amongst us and also the instructional sort of a technologist amongst us, we'll call that, have a certain amount of their time 
that's a that's a decision that library heads have to make right and that the people who run i t they have to make they have to say if i'm going to hire these people and i want to really truly empower them to do these kinds of role uh, projects they also need some time in which we trust that that time will be spent on valuable research. That's a, that that is an important thing for our institution. Lacking that will always be in the situation of not ever having any time and not knowing what, because we won't be assessed for those things in the end. Yeah. Can I, can I comment? Please. Um, I totally agree with you, David, um, especially when Ryder said he doesn't have the time. Uh, if you have a project that's initiated by a faculty and you want to just use it in your classroom and not use it in your research, then maybe um, somebody in the library would help for one or two sessions and that's it. But if you're invested in that project and the, li and the librarian has other duties to do, as David said, it's a conversation with a higher level uh, person in the library, then you really have to rely on your own resources. You have to find other spaces like WordPress or other repositories where you can actually host it and the students from one semester to the other build on it but then there's not always someone ready to give you their time when you need it because you know there's some certain moments in the semester where you need the support more than others and that doesn't really happen. So that's why I'm saying I'm working on a document where how can we, you know, untangle the infrastructure so that such possibilities are sustained, you know, created and sustained. So I'm, I apologize there, well, after we just talked about those topics, all the hands in the room went up, right? Um, but we do have to cut ourselves, we have to cut off for a question of time. Three people have a microphone, do we have time? We have only, I think we have time for one question maximum, right? The first one, decide who that's gonna be. <laughs> All right, then the one that spoke up the loudest, mm -hmm. I guess it's it. Please, go ahead. And we'll have one question, and then we have to move on. We have the unconference, which begins, in which we could actually continue this conversation with the unconference. Um, so I have a question to Ryder um, about the Python you mentioned. Can you elaborate more on that? If, or can you showcase the website? How uh, you like are using it? The Python language or the web archive? or? Both. Okay, so Python is a language and it's, I think it's, I'm not a programmer, but it seemed in the 10 hours pretty straightforward that if I committed myself, I could learn it. It's not, you know, too, it didn't seem too crazy. Um, and my goal was to learn how to, you know, when you create a website, you have HTML tags and just put out a tag of the language and just ma see how language changed on the sites from 2011 to 2014 or how the links changed between different groups. Um, um, and then, lo and behold, I'm Googling this type of um, pro project, and Stanford has created a Python program that can do it, but I think the value of learning at least some Python from the um, workshop would be maybe their program requires a bit of editing, or you know, you wanna make tweaks to it. Um, so there are definitely projects like this. A Canadian did it with their political parties, which I'm sure is much less interesting than Egypt. Um, and so people have done this, and that's the other great thing about digital humanities is there's a lot of things you can kind of build on. Um, yeah. Do you use it with a certain application or software, or you just create the web page on the WordPress and use the language? For the web archive or the um, software, uh, we use Archivit which is from the Internet Archive, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but there are free software tools available that you can download the websites. And that's something else I would like Amical to be involved with. Um, but it's fun, it's challenging, but it's uh, a good project. And we all, most of our countries have elections and politics and things like this. So it could be um, <laughs> really, really interesting just to, to see. And so, yeah. Sorry, Thanks. I hope that's good, but we can so talk about it later. Thanks. I need to, so let's just, I want to just thank our panelists for being so sharing about their experiences there. <laughs> and um, so uh, next up uh, in a matter of one minute or less than one minute um, is the unconference. Um, and I think that uh, we could have some very interesting within our institution and those that
like process. I have a couple gifts for people, uh, thanks to 